Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining me here today on the Moat Sea Show. My name is Ross, and I'm coming to you live from Moat Marine Laboratory located in Sarasota, Florida. Now, I am so excited to be hanging out with all of you folks today. We have a wonderful audience that's tuning in all around the United States. So it's wonderful to see that we have connections up in Boston to California, and that we're all going to be learning about some amazing topics today in today's presentation. Now, we have some pretty sick presentations lined up for you today. And because the topic of today's live stream is learning all about ocean health. What is marine health? Do fish get sick in the first place? So we are going to be diving in and meeting some amazing guest scientists, learning about what Moat is doing to keep the ocean healthy, and providing some insight into some behind-the-scenes research that you will be able to ask our scientists directly. So state-of-the-art stuff. It's going to be really exciting. Now, based on today's presentation, we're going to be highlighting different areas of Moat Marine Laboratory, because not only are we a public aquarium, but we're a world-famous marine laboratory and scientific institution. And our two guest speakers who will be meeting soon are from two completely different departments, and yet they have so much in common. So how's that for a little cliffhanger on the edge of your seat? Now, in order to make sure that we're all awake, I know it's still pretty early in the morning, depending on where you're connecting from. Thank you, all you West Coasters out there. We are going to have a few little interactive quiz questions. And then at the very end of the presentation, we'll make sure that we leave about 10 minutes for open Q&A into the chat box. So throughout this presentation, you better get ready because we will be throwing some quiz questions up. For example, our first quiz question actually for today is going to be starting just to get us off on a hot topic. So our very first quiz question, what do you think makes underwater animals sick? So we do have a polling feature. So let's use that polling feature. So do you think it's a, viruses and bacteria, B, pollution, C, climate change, or D, all of the above? So let's use that Zoom polling feature to see how much prior knowledge you all have coming into this presentation. So for example, pollution, is that an issue? Can climate change make animals sick? Are there even such things as underwater viruses? What would that even look like? So I don't know, or do you think it's a, just a safe gamble and going D all the above? So we'll give you a few seconds to participate in our Zoom poll. So meanwhile, it's gonna get those juices flowing to start asking questions for our amazing guest experts that we'll be meeting in a moment. All right, so hopefully you've had enough time to participate in our Zoom answer. So before we unveil the correct answer, we actually have a wonderful news segment all lined up for you today. So we're going to be turning it over to our PR manager, Stephanie Kettle, with some current events. So we'll be right back momentarily. Hi, everyone. I'm Stephanie Kettle, and here's the news that's making waves. Sea turtles have arrived on beaches in Florida. Sea turtle mothers began arriving on the east coast of Florida last month, and Moat Marine Lab is very excited to announce that they have officially arrived in the Sarasota region as well. To date, 16 nests have been uncounted on the stretch of beach from Longboat Key through Venice, and that's before our season has officially started. Remember, on May 1, it's time to abide by all local ordinances for lighting, furniture, and more. Check out moat.org 2020 nesting for weekly updates on nesting numbers and for tips to keep sea turtles safe. Speaking of sea turtles, Moat's Sea Turtle Rehabilitation Hospital and Stranding Investigations teams have been very busy as well, rescuing and releasing local injured sea turtles. One recent patient, nicknamed Egg, was released off Lido Key after recovering from red tide exposure and having a plastic bag in its stomach. See all of Moat's current patients at moat.org slash hospital. A disease is currently causing devastation on Florida's coral reef. Sony coral tissue loss disease is infecting over 20 species of coral, and in some areas that mortality rate is over 80%. While there's still a lot unknown about the disease, rest assured that most scientists are on the case. Two recent peer-reviewed publications put us closer to understanding this disease, which will be important for managing it and doing restoration. Moat scientists were able to map the spread and hot spots of the disease and where they occurred in the last few years, helping us see how much currents actually played a role in the spread of the disease. Additionally, another paper puts us a step closer at identifying the pathogen that spreads the disease, most likely the bacteria. You can read more at moat.org news. 
And don't forget, even though Moat Aquarium is closed to the public, we are still caring. Moat's animal care staff will still continue to give our animals the food and fun they need, and we're bringing it to you. Be sure to check out all the amazing virtual content on Moat's social media and on our website at moat.org slash virtual. Amazing. All right. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie, for queuing us in with some of the news that is making waves. Now, as Stephanie mentioned, pollution is a huge issue with that trash getting into the stomach of that sea turtle. We did talk about that coral disease. So, oh my gosh, what was the correct answer to our first quiz question? What do you think ocean animals may get sick? Why do you think they get sick? What is causing them to get sick? And to answer this question, I am so excited to introduce our two amazing guest experts for today. We are joined by coral disease biologist Katie Eaton, and we are joined by Dr. Whitney Green, a marine animal veterinarian. So I am so excited to be turning it over to them to answer this first question. So Katie and Whitney, what is the correct answer? All right, so we're going to pull up your video and hopefully you're unmuted at this point. Awesome. So while we get you all connected, we are out on an island here at Moat Marine Lab. So sometimes our sandbars aren't always full. <laughs> all right, there's Whitney. Wonderful. All right, Whitney, what is your correct answer? Uh, so all of the above. Sea creatures, just like humans, uh, can be infected by virtually anything from trauma to pollution to different types of diseases. Awesome. So unfortunately, that's a really sad answer that considering that there is so much taking place out in the world, out in the oceans, there's a lot of stressors to make these ocean animals sick. But luckily, we have amazing experts like you and Katie that are doing everything you can in order to keep the oceans healthy and the world healthy. So while we get Katie all pulled up, we're going to turn it over to Whitney Green just to give us some more information. So Dr. Green, Oh my gosh, you are so cool. You are a veterinarian for a marine laboratory and aquarium. And just like we, we have a lot of ocean experts in the making because clearly 90% of our audience chose D, all of the above. So we might have some people vying for your job in the future, Whitney. So let us know. Tell us a little bit more about a day in the life of an aquarium veterinarian. Uh, okay, so yes, I'm Dr. Green. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I have been at Moat for about a year and a half, and as the veterinarian on staff, I'm in charge of monitoring and maintaining the health of all of the creatures uh, that are a part of Moat. So that includes um, helping with some of the research animals, that includes all of the collection animals at the aquarium, as well as uh, the animals in the whale and dolphin hospital, as well as the sea turtle hospital. So every day is uh, completely different. I can be working with cetaceans or sea turtles and coral and fish and really everything in between. So it's a, it's a really exciting job. It's a very interesting and intellectually stimulating job where we have to constantly learn and adapt to all of the different creatures and the problems that present to us. Gosh, what an awesome answer. That is amazing that you are the jack of all trades from dolphins and whales all the way down to the smallest fishes and invertebrates. Now, speaking of invertebrates, we're going to turn it over to Katie Eaton, our coral disease biologist. So in order to focus on some spineless science, let's meet Katie and some of the squishier animals that she takes care of. So Katie, what does it mean to even be a coral disease biologist? How? how, how? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the introduction, Ross. Uh, so my name is Katie. I'm a biologist in the Coral Health and Disease Research Program here at Moat. And within our research program, we take a variety of different approaches to understand coral diseases and why corals get sick and why some corals are more susceptible to disease than others. So within our program, we have a lab down at our Keys facility, the International Center for Coral Reef Research and Restoration. And we also have a research lab uh, here at the Sarasota campus. So I'm primarily responsible for uh, managing the lab space here at the Sarasota campus and managing the experiments that we conduct within our coral disease research lab here. That is absolutely incredible that both of you are working in very different areas of our aquarium and marine lab, and yet you're both focusing on ocean health. So I know this is a really hard to answer question, but do you have a day in the life 
of what it's like to be a coral disease biologist, to be a veterinarian. Does every, I mean, clearly Whitney is dealing with different animals every day. So that looks super varied. So considering that we have Katie that just answered our last question, can you just walk us through what your lab looks like? What do you do on a daily basis? How do you keep corals healthy? Yeah, so fortunately, I get to do a lot of different really cool things here at Moat. So we have a coral disease research lab that has a couple of big tanks with seawater in it that has live corals. So a lot of my time just goes to maintaining our corals that we use for research experiments and research purposes. We also have a molecular lab and a microbiology lab. And so part of my job is maintaining all the equipment within those labs too. Um, I also mentor undergraduate interns and volunteers year round and help students conduct their own research projects over the summer. And another big part of my job is managing the grant funded projects that our lab completes within our Sarasota lab. Gosh, that is so cool. So not only are you doing molecular science, all right, fancy scientist right there, but you're also mentoring the future generations of marine scientists. So for all of you soon to be ocean scientists, who knows, you could be an intern for Katie if corals and ocean health and disease is a passion of yours or a newly sparked passion. All right, we're going to turn over to Dr. Green. So you are working with hundreds of animals on a daily basis. So, I mean, how do you balance the prescriptions, for example, of these animals? How do you balance diets? Are you working with all the aquarists, the scientists? How do you manage all of this? Oh, I'm so sorry, Whitney. It looks like you're muted. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, that's a great question. Um, it definitely takes a village. No one person can manage it all just due to the variety and depth of information uh, that is required. So I work very closely with the aquarists and the marine mammal trainers. Um, they have very close relationships with their animals. Uh, so I rely on that strong relationship to not only can they identify individual problems that happen, um, but also for the behaviors that they're able to train the animals uh, to make routine exams and treatments less stressful for them. Uh, so that relationship is very, very key. And uh, aquatic medicine is a very small field. So we rely very heavily on our peers and our colleagues um, because just because I might have a certain case with a sea turtle, there might not be too many people that have had that experience. So having that close relationship with your peers and colleagues is absolutely vital. Uh, so a lot of teamwork, a lot of reading, um, a lot of research and thinking outside of the box and time management are, are key in order to be able to balance it all. Gosh, that is wild. I mean, the fact that you are able to deal with a, the internal anatomy of a sea turtle one hour and a dolphin the next, you can bounce between reptiles to mammals to invertebrates to fish. That is absolutely nuts. I can't even, I can't even begin to fathom that. So just to like get to know you a little bit more, Dr. Green, can you tell us, do you have a favorite animal that you like working with or do you have a most challenging animal you like working with or what's your just most amazing story? I would say it's a species of the day. Uh, I could <laughs> never pick, I could never pick one species, but it's usually the species of the day or species at the moment and usually it's a top five. Um, you know, I thought as you got older and you learned more, you were supposed to focus and narrow your interests to more specific either species or diseases. And in fact, uh, I went the other way and I've broadened and learned that I love everything. Um, so I, when I was younger, marine mammals were my favorite. I really wanted to be a, a dolphin or a killer whale trainer. That was kind of my dream. Um, and as I got older and got more interested in research, I realized that I loved everything from turtles to fish and coral. Um, it's all just very stimulating and interesting and great to learn about different types of species. Um, and in terms of interesting cases, it's really hard to narrow it down because they're all so different. Um, but I love, I love cases that really make you think outside of the box um, and extrapolate your, your thought process. There is so little known about many of the aquatic creatures that we work with on a daily basis. So sometimes the closest animal that you have as a comparison is a dog or cat, which is mm. obviously very different from coral or sea turtles or anything. So just being able to use those comparisons and extrapolate it is really, really fun. Gosh, that is such a wild thing to think about that. Is there, I mean, I know this is a really naive question, Dr. Green, but is there dolphin medicine or is there, is there specific dolphin medicine? Is there just mammal medicine? If, are you applying the same kind of dosages and medicine that you might have to a 
larger land animal that might be more easily accessible to a larger marine mammal? I mean, what does that even look like prescribing medication to ocean life? Well, some of the doses are very big and some of the doses are very small. <laughs> I guess we are, uh, I guess we're currently writing the book. So it depends the, the book on, on marine medicine. So depending on the species, there's more information known. Uh, there's a lot more information known about many of your larger animals, like your mammals um, and sea turtles, whereas coral uh, is, is kind of a frontier right now that we are really starting to explore and learn more about where there just is not a lot known about their medicine. Um, so it really depends on the case and whether you need to give a really big dose or a really small dose. That's awesome. Well, it's so lucky that we have Katie on the line to do all of this coral research. So Katie, I'm going to bounce over to you and pretty much ask you the same question. So what does, what is it like working with these animals? So do you get to work with the ecosystem as a whole? Do you focus on one particular species? And I also know that you just got back from a super awesome research trip. So while you're answering what it's like to be a field scientist versus a lab scientist, highlight this awesome field work that you get to do as well. Sure. So uh, within our coral health and disease program, fortunately, we have a lot of different projects going on right now. So I guess I'll start with the St. Croix project. Uh, we recently kicked off a two year project in collaboration with the National Park Service to test and develop effective treatments for coral diseases within the Virgin Islands. So we took a trip back in January and we'll be going a couple more times this year and next year. And basically what we're trying to do is develop different methods that can potentially treat these corals in the wild. So whether that be using a particular antibiotic or using methods such as culling, which would be re complete removal of the diseased area mm. or trenching, cutting a line between the healthy tissue and diseased tissue. So really just trying to get out in the field and develop effective ways to treat these diseases. <laughs> so, I mean, that's so funny that you say trenching in order to separate. So I just think of corals have to social distance too. That's, <laughs> that's hilarious. So considering that corals are a, actually an animal, so a coral reef like the one that I'm in right now is a giant ecosystem made of lots of little teeny tiny coral polyps. Katie, how do you treat these little teeny tiny animals? I mean, do you have to give them shots or is it just a take one a day and call me back in the morning kind of deal? <laughs> So it really depends on the disease that you're trying to treat. And unfortunately, coral diseases, it's really difficult to pinpoint what causes the disease and you know, what we can do to help the coral and prevent these diseases from happening in the future. So there's one disease in particular, the black fan disease, that uh, we developed uh, like a hydrogen peroxide treatment for that we apply to the lesioned area. And we're hoping that you know, that will stop the spread of the disease. And then for other diseases like white plague or yellow band, that's what we're using um, basically like an underwater angle grinder to remove that lesioned area or create that trench. Gosh, that is wild. So not only do you have to understand animal biology, you have to understand medicine and you have to use tools underwater. Dang, that is wild to think about. Look at you. This is wild. So considering that there is so much going on and that you're using all of these different tools, I do want to highlight one of the most amazing things that Katie gets to work with, and those are raceways. So that's a big fancy science word for this really neat laboratory. Can you elaborate on more what a raceway is? I promise it doesn't have anything to do with NASCAR or anything. <laughs> yeah, so this image here actually shows the raceways that we have within our lab uh, in Sarasota. Basically, it's these giant tanks that the corals sit in, and that's where we conduct a lot of our uh, tank experiments as well. So in addition to you know, the field research that we do and the molecular research, we do a lot of uh, lab-based experiments exposing corals to disease and you know, trying to figure out if there are any corals, you know, specific genetic strains that are more resistant to certain diseases. So that's um, what takes place in those raceways there. Gosh, that is so cool. So you get to create your own little mini oceans, expose them to different chemistries or diseases and see who survives and what you can do in order to encourage coral populations, regardless of the species, hopefully to survive. Now, we have provided some great background on who Katie is and who Dr. Green is. So now we're going to jump on to our next question. So we're going to get ready for our next topic to better understand some of those threats, some of those diseases that are impacting oceans around the world. So get ready for pop quiz question number two. 
So we're going to pull up our Zoom poll once again. So which are the names of real marine diseases? So hippopathology and round disease, toxopharmacology and ring disease, toxoplasmosis and band disease, and tonsillectomy and stripe disease. So what do you think is the correct answer? Now, just as a little bit of warning, all of these are real things, but only one of them pertains to marine diseases. So what do we think? Now, interestingly enough, I took a little bit from both of our guest speakers. So one of them directly relates to marine mammals, like the animals that Dr. Green gets to work with, and one of them directly relates to the corals that Katie gets to work with. So hopefully you're nearly done answering in our Zoom poll, and let's see what those results look like when we have the chance to pull them up. And while we're pulling up those answers, Katie and Whitney, which is the correct answer? Let's see. It is... C. C, that's right, great, absolutely. So it turns out, wow, we have a really amazing and engaged audience. 85% of the audience knew that it was toxoplasmosis and band disease. Ah, so toxopharmacology, that'd be hilarious. That's a lot of the pharmaceutical medicines that we do and actually use to treat some of these diseases. So let's bounce over to Dr. Green. So can you tell us a little bit more about what toxoplasmosis looks like and what, moving beyond that, are some of the most routine diseases that you see from part of your stranding investigation program, from field research that you're doing, from animals that are brought into our hospital? Uh, yes. No, that was a great question. That was a fun one. Um, so there are different diseases that can affect different creatures. And in terms of the most common ones, um, I, I guess it depends on the species. Right now, uh, we are having a lot of different turtles that are coming into our hospital. And we've had several that have come in with red tide, unfortunately. Mm. Um, and probably the most common thing that we've been seeing right now are entanglement, uh, entanglement injuries. So we've had to do various types of treatments um, for just the degree of severity. An animal can come in, you know, with a fish hook uh, lodged in its mouth that can cause different things to build up on that so the animal can't eat, so they get really skinny as a result, um, to m even more severe cases than that where you have fishing line and netting wrapped around different appendages. Uh, we had, it was so bad one time that the bone in the turtle's flipper was completely crushed that we had to amputate the full flipper. Ooh. Um, he recovered beautifully uh, and released him several months ago, but that is unfortunately probably the most common thing that we're seeing. Uh, red tide is another very interesting disease because mm -hmm. the animals come in very affected uh, by the disease and with the appropriate treatment, they rebound very quickly um, and do really well and you can release them as long as you're releasing them into, into a good spot. So I'd say that's some of what we're seeing uh, the most often at the moment, um, mm -hmm. but again, it depends on, it depends on the creature. Uh, and it depends on the season for sure. Wow. So seasonality, that's wild to think about that. We have a cold and flu season, and that's the same case as underwater life as well. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I also want to give Dr. Green this amazing shout out. So she said that she's been here for about a year and a half. And within just a few weeks of being here, she gets a dolphin handed to her to work with. So this was Salem the dolphin. So uh, Dr. Green, can you tell us a little bit more about Salem's story that you are brand new to Moat staff and suddenly you are getting a dolphin to work with. What happened and how did that turn out? Yeah, Salem was a Salem was was quite a quite an adventure. Uh, <laughs> she was here pretty much when I started. Uh, she was an older female bottlenose dolphin um, and she came in with with pretty non-specific signs, minus the fact that she had a very large shark bite um, in her peduncle, so down in her, uh, her tail region. Hmm. So uh, as a result of the shark bite wound, um, she was very anemic. So that means she has very low red blood cells, which hmm. would make sense if she were bit by a shark because you lose a lot of blood. Hmm. Um, addition, in addition to that, you know, she also had pretty severe infections. Um, and it's most likely been going on for a long time. So once you get compromised uh, and with the anemia, which makes you more tired and not able to swim as fast, you lose weight, that predisposes you to other problems as well. So she had a whole bunch of different problems when, uh, when she came in. So to treat her, we had to really have round the clock treatments and we were treating her shark bite wound, treating her with antibiotics. 
um, and then monitoring all of her other organ function because as I said, you know, this was a, a longer duration illness. So she had other systems that were involved as well. So we had to get her liver back healthy and her kidneys healthy and everything back to normal. And then once you have normal functioning, that's when you want to get the weight on them. So it was a very long process with a lot of different problems, um, but, but she did great. That was a real great success story. That is absolutely wild. So, I mean, just hearing you walk through the scientific process is really inspiring. So the fact that you were able to assess the blood loss from the shark bite to the systemic infections to the organs, I mean, it's really cool to see your scientific thinking behind this. So it's also like a domino effect that you get one thing and kind of snowballs into another. So whatever ended up happening to Salem and are we caught up to date on what, where she is right now? Uh, yeah, now she, uh, we released her um, quite a while ago now, um, and she, the release went wonderful, um, and she gained as much, as much weight as she had originally lost, and then even more, um, so it was, it was a great success story, but yeah, no, the whole team released her, it was a great team effort, and you're, you're absolutely right, you know, there is a domino effect, and as a veterinarian, we're trained to really try to not just, you know, zero in and look at one problem. You know, when she came in, it would be very easy to focus on she was bit by a shark. And if you were so focused on that, you wouldn't see all of the other problems. So that is a very important part of the job. But yeah, you know, with a lot of teamwork, a lot of hard work and a lot of innovative thinking, um, we got her back and healthy and back into the ocean where she belongs. Now, before we move on to Katie, sorry, Katie, one last question. We actually, this actually aligns perfectly with one of our pre-program audience engagement questions. Someone asked, how do you weigh a dolphin in the first place? So how, how do you weigh a dolphin? A very big scale. <laughs> 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 yeah, it, not actually. It's actually pretty, uh, pretty small, but you, you have to get them into a sling and then you lift them mm. out of the water. So you'd be amazed at how much weight water actually uh, gets. So mm. you get the animal into the sling, you lift them out using a crane, um, and then the scale is attached to your, your sling that holds them up and then you're able to get a nice accurate weight. That is wild. So yeah, perfect transition. Now, all right, Katie, we're gonna bounce back over to you. So now that we answer the toxoplasmosis part, we're gonna jump over and see if we can answer the band disease component. So Katie, one of the terms that I hear a lot is coral bleaching. And I know that you have a really adorable and really hilarious coral stress analogy. So can you walk us through diseasing, stress, bleaching, what's going on with corals? Absolutely. Uh, so coral diseases, I think as I mentioned before, it's really hard to pinpoint the exact cause of coral disease and why corals get sick. But we do believe that it's in response to a number of threats as to why corals get sick in the first place. So there are different kinds of like bacteria in the ocean that can cause certain diseases. But when corals are already stressed out from other stressors, such as ocean warming and pollution, mm. um, corals face a plethora of local and global stressors that are really causing high rates of declines. When they're already faced with these stressors, it makes them much more susceptible to getting sick. So I like to compare it to humans because that's really how people understand it the best. Um, you know, when humans are stressed out from things like not sleeping well or not eating well, like when I was in college during finals week, I would stay up all night studying, not eating very well, just not taking care of my body and I'd always get sick. And it's really the same with corals. You know, when they're stressed out from things like ocean warming and pollution, they're much more likely to get diseased. And so ocean warming uh, causes the corals to bleach. So coral bleaching essentially means the coral mm. is spitting out that algae that lives inside of it. Mm. Corals, the animal has a symbiotic relationship with an algae that it really needs to survive. So when the oceans get a little too warm, it expels that algae and it becomes much more likely to get sick and die. So Katie, we're looking at a very Neapolitan ice cream looking coral head right now. So that image that was pulled up on the screen, we had a green area, we had a red stripe, and then we had that white area. So mm -hmm. can you walk us through what the disease is? What's the healthy coral versus the sick coral versus is a bleach coral actually dead or is there any hope? Mm -hmm. Yes, so this image you're seeing here is an example of a colony that has red band disease. So really creative name. <laughs> All right. <laughs> As scientists, we really come up with the simplest names as possible. For these things. Uh, so that band, that red band that you see there is 
kind of a community of different bacteria that are essentially consuming that live tissue. So it's moving as it infects a colony and it mo moves over the colony and consumes that live tissue and leaves that white bare skeleton. And corals oh. can't recover from this because their tissue is completely gone. When corals bleach, they're not losing that tissue. They're just losing that algae that lives inside of them. So they can recover from bleaching, but they can't recover from these diseases. Oh gosh, that is gruesome. Having your skin just eaten off. Oh, yeah. that is whew, nightmare material. We should have saved this for Halloween. Oh my goodness. Now, Katie, I also want to give you a giant shout out as well. So your team of scientists not only looks at local populations, but also global populations. So the fact that you are able to look internationally, I know that you were supposed to go to a company conference in Germany. So that's absolutely wild that you are not only looking at the Florida reef track, but you also have to use your scientific thinking and deductions in order to actually see global trends as well. So that just proves what I like to call it scary science, right? You are doing really intense, hardcore molecular science. Now, in order to, so mad props to you, look at you saving the world. So in order to highlight some of the amazing work that Katie and her team is working on, we have an awesome video for you. So we're going to turn it over to a video that spotlights our Coral Research and Restoration Science Center down in the Florida Keys. So it's, our, it's called IC2R3. It's a huge mouthful. And that's where Katie gets to ricochet back and forth between. So look at the Florida track, reef track down in the Keys versus the laboratory up here. So we're going to turn it over to this, to Z, uh, this video and we'll be right back. Field research, you usually need a good support system. Them. Moat's new building allows us to have that. At IC2R3, we have incredible capabilities of collaborating with dry lab space and field support. In addition to all that, there's a wet lab environment, both indoor and outdoor. Ocean acidification has been called things like the evil twin of climate change or the other carbon dioxide problem. It is causing some difficulties for organisms that live in the ocean. What's really great about this facility is our capacity to really replicate a lot of communities and these numerous raceways. This is a really great place to do ocean acidification research. So here in the Molecular Biology Laboratory, we incorporate multiple different molecular techniques to look at the DNA of different organisms. What I love about the research labs here at Moat Marine Laboratory is that we offer so many resources that will help answer so many questions. Understanding disease dynamics in relation to coral reefs is incredibly important for trying to allow these reefs to recover and become some type of ecosystem similar to what we've had in the past. What we'll do is we'll take a large piece of coral and cut them into centimeter squares. And so the idea is that we're reskinning the reef and we're also making the corals sexually mature faster so that, that they can, within two and a half to three and a half years, reseed the reefs themselves. The real key is the way in which we're putting them out the densities and the genotypic diversity. We have several hundred structures, each growing 100 corals or more. Because mode is down here, we can work on tens of thousands of corals at a time. They provide protection from shoreline by absorbing wave energy. They provide novel sources for compounds that we can use to fight things like cancer or antibiotic resistant bacteria. And they're the foundation for tourism in the fishing industry of the state of Florida and are estimated to be worth at least $6 billion to our state economy. And so I think informing the public is really the biggest way to enact change. If the public doesn't know what's happening, how can we fix anything that's happening in the ocean? How inspirational is that? So we have scientists that are working up here in our Florida campus, up in our Sarasota location, as well as down in our Florida Keys location. So as our scientists in that video mentioned, we got to understand and we got to educate. So Katie, it is wonderful that you are here sharing the world-changing research that you are contributing to. Now we're also going to jump back over to Whitney Green. 
So Whitney, I want to ask you one last question before we turn it over to your video. So have you ever done a host? I know that not only do you work with our aquarium, but you also work in our animal hospital. Have you ever done a 911 call? I mean, like midnight or like quick emergency room. How do you manage under an ocean animal stress and essentially uh, almost, I want to say, emergency operating room procedures? All right, so as we switch over, so we're gonna jump, oh, perfect, awesome, there you are, love it. Yeah, so emergency situations um, in aquatic creatures is just like with your dogs or cats that can have emergencies and humans that can have emergencies. They can happen anytime, any day, holiday or anything. So yes, that is something, um, that, is something that I've dealt with many a time. And you deal with it just like any other time an animal presents, so you calm and rational and, identify what the problem is and figure out how to fix it and make the animal better as quickly uh, as you can. So not being stressed and not getting um, upset is one of the most important things. A lot of these animals that come in do not have specific signs. We talked a little bit about Salem, you know, that there were a lot of different things going on. So you really have to work at each case individually and very thoroughly in order to identify the problem. Gosh, that's awesome that you can be able to prioritize the immediate need on call, on site, on location. That is wonderful. Now we're gonna pull up a video of our animal hospital. So you can actually see where Whitney gets to work. You get to see her team, her staff, what we get to bring in from the ocean as well as some of our aquarium residents as well. So how do we give an ocean animal a checkup? Let's check it out. Keeping track of the health of our animals in our local environment is hugely important, not only for the animals, but it has a human impact as well. We work closely to respond to animals that are in distress or that find themselves beached. Well, all the species we work with are great indicator species, our turtles, our dolphins, our whales. They're on the front line, so if we start seeing issues with them and their environment, it's just a matter of time before it's starting to affect humans. Moat is one of those institutions that's well known in the conservation world. So our rehabilitation hospital, our main goal is to get those animals that come into us back out so they can then be a productive part of the population out in the wild. A lot of what we do is supportive care. We also do surgical procedures um, as we have to take very subtle cues from these animals. It's a big team effort here to get these animals healthy again and get them back out into the oceans. People have come to expect Moat to do this. Not only are we doing a service for the community, but also for these animals that we think are really, really important. Any animal that's here would never have made it back out to the wild had we not helped. We have an opportunity here to really make a difference doing everything we can to help with the health of the oceans. Gosh, isn't that heartwarming? Oh my goodness, look at the front lines work that you are doing. So you are directly helping all of our residents here at our aquarium and local Sarasota populations as well. So thank you so much, Dr. Green. Now, before we move on, we're gonna put up our last quiz question for the day. So it's, uh, there's no correct answer, it's just to see what you think you can do in order to protect the ocean. So we do have some different suggestions. So but feel free to type into the chat what you think you can do in order to keep the ocean healthy. We've provided some suggestions, but we'd love to hear if you have any original thinking as well. Now, while you are typing into the chat and while you are participating in our final Zoom poll for today's webinar, I wanna open it up to Katie and Dr. Green to see if they have any suggestions on what you can do, no matter where you're tuning in from, from Boston to California and everywhere in between, what can we do in our daily life to keep the oceans healthy? So, we'll start with Katie. What can people do to help keep corals safe, no matter where you are in the world? Yeah, so there's a couple of different things that you can do that will directly contribute to helping coral reefs. 
Um, one of the options that you had in the poll actually reduced reuse recycle, uh, reducing the amount of plastic going into the ocean. We are finding that um, once plastic gets into the ocean and breaks down into really small pieces, the coral can actually ingest that and it'll get sick from that too. So plastic is definitely an issue for corals. Another uh, potential solution could be to use uh, reef safe sunscreens. So using primarily mineral based sunscreens and avoiding ones with really harsh chemicals can help coral reefs as well. Gosh, that is a great answer and a really good plug for our webinar next month is on coral safe sunscreen. So thanks for uh, teasing that right now. Now, Katie, I know that you are also a nonprofit funded scientist and that you are very grant dependent as well. Is there anything that we can financially do to keep your research churning? Absolutely. So here at Moat, we offer the Protect Our Reefs license plate, which is actually a really easy way to contribute to us if you are a Florida resident. Uh, basically, when you're going to renew your registration, just say that you want to purchase a Protect Our Reefs license plate, and a lot of that money will go directly to our research. Gosh, that is awesome. So if you visit Florida or if you're a Florida resident, this is a great way to support our nonprofit marine laboratory and keep Katie out in the ocean, helping protect these amazing reefs and ecosystems. All right, Dr. Green, what is your answer? What can people do in order to keep animals healthy? So you work with sea turtles, you work with dolphins. So I know that those are big world traveling international animals. So how can people protect these amazing world voyagers? Um, Katie's answers were great. Um, and I think all of the answer choices that were up on that question are all great options. Um, I think that the biggest thing that people can do is just to be informed, educate yourself. Uh, if you have a question on something, you know, try and learn more about it, find the answer. Uh, no one is perfect and no one can uh, do everything you know that we need to do to, to help save the oceans but every little bit that you do helps and I think that finding um, finding the changes in your life that you can do whether it's sustainable you know using reusable bags that seems like a really easy solution but if you ask my mother or sister they forget them every single time however they are the best recyclers I've ever met, you know? So, so figuring mm -hmm. out the, the modifications that you can do, that you can do regularly, and, uh, and using those is great. Um, and then just learning about the problems, educating yourself, and being an advocate uh, and spokesperson for the ocean and supporting, uh, supporting research and supporting um, companies that are working to help save our oceans. Oh, what a wonderful answer. I also have to give Dr. Green's office a shout out. She has by far the best view in our entire facility. She gets to be right next to the otters and the manatees. And if you're jealous of Dr. Green's setup, then and you want to be able to hang out with otters and manatees and sharks and more amazing animals, consider supporting us through an Adopt an Animal program as well. So this is a great way to directly fund most research and animal care programs. So by adopting these animals, not only do you get an adorable companion stuffed animal, either a shark, a manatee, tons of diversity, but also your proceeds go directly to taking care of the animal that you are adopting as well as the hospital research that goes into keeping these animals nice and healthy. Plus, you often get a personalized letter from the scientist that is in the department of the animal that you just purchased. So it's a wonderful way to stay connected to the individual aquarium biologist and to Dr. Green, who takes care of everything under the sun. All right, so I see that we are winding down on a, our time, unfortunately. I can't believe how fast this flew by. So I want to make sure that we have a chance to open it up to our audience. So at this point, feel free to type into the chat box any questions you have for our amazing guest experts. And while you are starting to type into our chat box, once again, I had a few pre-assessment questions. So I wanted to ask Dr. Green one of the questions that we rolled in way before our program even started. So a lot of our guests know that we have alligators here. Do alligators get a toothache? And how do you take an alligator to the dentist? <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry, Whitney, uh, you're muted again. Oh, there we go, perfect. Okay, uh, that's a great question. And <laughs> alligators, I'm sure, can certainly get a toothache. They can be very feisty um, and get into some scruffs and arguments with the other animals that can cause uh, their teeth to fall out and can cause some pain. Um, so I guess how you take an alligator to the dentist, well, one of the great things about being an aquatic veterinarian is I'm the dentist. So <laughs> do everything under the sun. So I guess very carefully, 
very carefully uh, is the answer. <laughs> so the alligators who live with us here at Moat, do you have to brush their teeth or do dental checkups with them? Um, we don't brush their teeth, uh, but we do do annual exams on them as well as exams mm. um, at any point, you know, when there's when there's a problem. A lot of a lot of the ocean creatures, including alligators, uh, they, they mask their symptoms. So it's a strategy that they use to try and not show mm. that they're weak to prey, you know. So by the time they're actually showing signs, they're actually much sicker um, mm. than they really are. So having strong preventative medicine programs, uh, which what we do at Mode is having annual exams where we look at everything, including dental exams and any tooth work that we need to do, uh, is part of every animal's wellness program. Awesome. That is a wonderful answer. Thank you so much. So it's wild to think that you are working with all of these animals, and that just proves how scrappy these ocean animals are. Now, we have a question for Katie asking about her internship programs. So we have a question for Katie from a college student. So Katie, can you let us know what you, your degree was? How did you become a coral disease biologist, and what does it take to become one of your interns? Look at that. You already have some fans. <laughs> I mean, besides myself, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so kind of how I got to where I am today is because of Moat's internship program. Uh, so I have a bachelor's degree in biology, and I came to Moat to do an internship right after my graduation. And I interned uh, down at our Keys facility for a few months, and then I came and did another internship here in Sarasota. And I got offered a job after being an intern for a few months. So it really led to great things. I am so grateful for the internship program that Mo offers. And in order to be eligible for it, um, you really, as long as you're either a current college undergraduate or a recent graduate, um, you can apply. I think there's a lot more information on the website. I think it's moat.org slash internship. But we do offer year-round opportunities, and there are scholarship opportunities as well. And then we also offer the um, a couple different REU programs over the summer as well, where you get to kind of do your own research project, which is really cool. Amazing. Now, I, I saw that we had a follow-up question in our chat as well. Is it only for college students, or do you have any volunteer opportunities or internships for high schoolers? We do take on uh, volunteers from time to time as well. Mm -hmm. It really just depends on the situation and the need for it, but we have taken on high school volunteers in the past. Um, I believe uh -huh. Mo has a high school internship program as well that sometimes those interns can come and work with us for a period of time as well. That is awesome. Imagine that, being in high school and getting to work with Katie, her raceways, her disease technology. That is absolutely wild. Now we have a question that's coming in for Dr. Green. So it says, when you relocate a turtle back out into the ocean, do you relocate them to the same spot that you collected them from? Do they get confused? Do they get turned around? What are the protocols about putting an animal back? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. So I guess it depends on the individual animal. So for the most part, you want to put them back where you found them. However, in a case like red tide, you don't want to put them right back where they came from because then they're going to go right back into the red tide. Mm. So it depends on, on the case. But in a perfect world, you put them back um, where they came from because that allows them to navigate better and they know where they are. Wow, awesome answer. Yeah, you would. that's wonderful. That's, uh, that totally makes sense. You don't want to put them back in the area that they had their stranding incident in the first place. Duh. <laughs> See, look at you. That's amazing. All right. Now, unfortunately, we are starting to wind down on, on time, which is really unfortunate. However, we have some amazing resources in case you have some questions that we didn't have time to get to. So I want to plug our Flipgrid page. Now, Flipgrid is an awesome website that we've partnered with where you can essentially ask us a free and secure personalized video question and we will respond with a personalized video answer. So if you have any follow-up questions for Katie or Dr. Green, feel free to leave us a question on our Flipgrid page. We will forward it on to them and they can actually act as your ocean science pen pals if you have any ocean health related questions in the future. Now, once again, I want to thank everyone so much for joining us here today. I want to thank Katie and Dr. Green for participating and hanging out with me. Before we sign off, do you, either of you have any final words, any final thoughts, sayings that you want to provide to our audience? Or just goodbyes. <laughs> thank you for tuning in, and I'm 
always happy to talk about the research that we do here at Moat. Uh, the coral disease research is incredibly important and I'm really fortunate that I get to sit here and talk to you about it. So thank you for having me today. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, thank you everyone for your interest and your time. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to follow up the way that Ross mentioned. And thank you for caring about our oceans. Oh, you are both the best. This is great. We're getting comments in our chat that is saying how inspired our audience is. Gosh, I'm leaving this program feeling equally inspired. So everyone, thank you so much. Go out and share one awesome fact that you learned from today's presentation, because the more we share, the more we care. And both Katie and Dr. Green are doing phenomenal research. So we want to share what we do here at Moat Marine Laboratory. So once again, my name is Ross. I'm coming to you live from the Moat Sea Show here at Moat Marine Laboratory. Tune in next month for another amazing webinar with some different guest experts and we hope to see you on Flipgrid and for future virtual learning programs again very soon. Bye everyone!